Thank you, everyone. I uh, struggled a little bit like the gentleman before me of what I can exactly share. So I thought maybe to do a bit of background on what I do, um, go over some visualizations and sort of what's happening in North America with ice hockey. Um, and then hopefully if I can inspire one person in here to even think of doing a startup, I know that there's a ton of different changes and challenges um, in this uh, market. But I truly believe that being your own boss, leading your own company, having your own say in what your future is, um, is one of the most incredible jobs in the world. So I think for everyone that thinks, oh, there's you know, so much competition, it's like there's never been more space with tech. There's never been more space in finding a niche area that you're really passionate about. And I've grown staff athletes uh, with my co-founders to over 200 employees. Uh, we've been around for 15 years. There's, of course, been up and downs, but you know the journey has been wonderful. So I thought to start off, um, I would go through a little exercise. Who here is from North America? Do we have any North Americans? Are you tired? Very tired? So guess this sport. OK, how to fix hockey. I stole this from Twitter. The field is effing huge. Shrink it. Too many players on the field. Limit it to two forwards, two defenders, and a goalie. Players should come and go whenever they want. Don't stop the game. Shrink the goal. And let's put ice everywhere. What sport do I have? Ice hockey. There we go. So in getting into that, I'm usually kind of a polarizing person because I sit right in the middle of tech and sports, tech and hockey. I probably do 90% tech, but people know me most for being on air, speaking to people, uh, doing this type of conference. You can see, um, as with football, soccer, hockey's a fairly conservative sport. They didn't tell me where they were wearing blue suits. I'm only wearing a black suit, so it's the only difference between the rest of us on that cover. Um, so it's been a challenge over the last 15 years to get not only the adoption, but the understanding of why data is important, how to collect data, why accuracy is important, and the different types of environments that you can use data effectively. Um, as well, I get that question of, you know, only, only women in the room. Um, how do I get recruit more women? How do I uh, become better for my women colleagues? And I think, you know, 51, 50% 50 of the population is women. So if you're not recruiting women, if you're not thinking outside the box of how to get more women in the pipeline, in your organization, on your teams, you're really missing out. So being that sponsor, as a woman, you know, taking that temperature of the room, being in an environment where you're comfortable, uh, where you know that you can use your skill set to the most advantage, um, I would, you know, implore everyone in this room to take a step back after you go home from the conference and think about, you know, how not only to recruit women, but how to make that environment so that everyone can thrive because you will have a competitive advantage having 50% more of the population to choose from. So at Stathletes, as I said, started 15 years ago. I would say my number one hat is an entrepreneur, startup, I guess now a scale up. I can't really call myself a startup anymore, but I like to have that mentality going into everything, right? Is how you can improve being small and nimble, even in larger groups. So when you think about hockey, I actually like comparing it to soccer. Not gonna lie, I steal a lot of soccer models. A lot of great research, like the gentleman before me was discussing, whether that's expected possession, expected goals. You can see this is just an animation over like the flow of hockey. It's very fast, the puck is very small. Um, in many ways, hockey is a lot harder uh, to track than soccer. We're in an arena, we have white jerseys, white ice, we have boards, we're indoors. Um, Kind of everything that could go wrong does go wrong in hockey. The puck is cold, so any sort of tracking inside the puck is always a challenge. Um, but the possession is really fluid. Um, there's a lot in the game, uh, and it provides a lot of opportunity for analysis, a lot of areas that people historically have missed. Uh, here's me on a panel. You can see I'm doing a baseball panel, and I would make the pitch to everyone. I'm actually doing the MLS panel, um, moderating that at 4.15. So come out to that chat to hear about what's happening in North American soccer. But when you think about, you know, the genesis of, of analytics, Bill James, who was, you know, writing articles in the 70s um, on baseball analytics, on 
you know, what separates certain teams, how to get a competitive advantage with data. Um, you know, it started very early in, in North America. And then there was a huge leg where all the rest of North American sports said, you know, hockey's too fast, you can punch people and fight, why are we taking data on that type of sport? So that's what provided a, an in 15 years ago, um, was doing work in general, um, analyzing certain hockey uh, video, and realized there wasn't a lot of people trying to provide different data sets to teams, to players, to get a competitive advantage, to understand a lot more about the game. So if I'm thinking now, I'm not looking at you know the traditional data collection, I'm thinking about all of the other silos, all of the different areas that emerging tech, generative AI, um, any of those areas are really disrupting. Um, and I you know, sit down, think about the 10 areas, the 10 problems you have in your department, the 10 problems that you're, you're trying to solve on, in your everyday life, whether it's in media, in sports books, um, all of the areas that touch data in sports, and reverse engineer if you have the skill set and if you know how to solve them. Because every entrepreneur, every startup starts with that one small idea. Um, and even if it's not scalable, sometimes the best traction is do something that's not scalable. That's really hard to do, that you know, enterprise, um, bigger companies don't want to touch. So for us at that time, that was data collection and we've definitely you know, drilled down on that element. I'm gonna go into like the action, transform some visuals because I thought, okay, if you're like, it's too stressful, I don't wanna have 200 employees, 1,000 employees, whatever, I love my job. I kind of have the evolution of some of our visualizations, so hopefully you get something out of that um, that you can take back to. Very simple computer vision, obviously overlaying the ice rink. Um, you can see this is just a bit of homography and where they are. Translating that into you know homography, so just the locations on the ice. Just a little video to show how tracking works in soccer or in hockey, very similar to soccer to football bounding boxes for their location, and then down to their frame. Uh, you can even see, you can you know, check what the, that referee is doing, where he's pointing, it's quite a nice goal. Uh, same two on the ice, so you know you can obviously take that 3D tracking into 2D, understand how they're moving, watch on second screens. As well, um, and I love the shirt in the audience, everyone watches women's sports, I looked through my emails. I did the first pitch to a women's uh, league in 2011. And every single year, I've done a women's project. And I love that StatsBomb has open source women's data. Um, I also have a competition called the Big Data Cup. So if there's any students in here, I publish data, um, done some women's, done some other anonymized data from men's that you can take, you can work with, um, you can submit for this Big Data Cup present online if you're not in North America. And it's just a way to generate not only ideas, but get more people working with women's data. So I've left that women's data up as well, um, Big Data Cup on GitHub. And it just allows you to have some, you know, understanding not only of hockey, but of the women's game, because I truly believe not just plugging and playing what has happened in the men's sport um, is important for the women's game. I think building the foundation of, hey, you can do things differently. You can use data differently. You can collect um, and be a lot uh, different. You're at the ground floor. Um, there's not a huge foundation, a hundred years of how this has always happened. So if you're interested in getting into women's sports or want to talk about women's data, that's one of my passions. So please come up to me afterwards and we can have that discussion. Um, and now something a little more dynamic as well. So going from, you know, the 2D, 3D tracking, homography and pose, um, and to some of those like more static displays of where goals were scored or not. Uh, this is getting into a little bit more of like use cases of computer vision. I'm sure a lot of people have seen um, different like second screen experiences where you can actually transform the game and look at it in different ways. So whether this is actual players, so that's the actual game um, that you're seeing there, you can see the players morph into their animated uh, 3D exactly the same as they would be on the video, and you can change them, right? I mean, you see a lot of this type of work 
um, whether that's for kids or for different second screen experiences, you can change them into like animation. I love this ability to actually stop and spin. You know, you're thinking of like tactics or positioning. You really want to do a breakdown with your team of like, here's when you went wrong or here's what you're doing and actually show them different views um, with the same video feed. I think that's really a neat feature that we've been able to develop and um, if anyone's interested in that sort of stuff as well, please come chat. Because um, for me, obviously, data just doesn't have to be on spreadsheets or in databases. It can be live, and you can interact with it in a wide variety of ways. So I always try to think of the different segments that use data. And I think for like coaching tactics, to be able to translate you know, what is complex into some simplicity, you don't need to know a data set to understand this is just modeling the game and allowing you to see different views and spin around and isolate certain players. Um, especially if you want a teachable moment with a player that maybe isn't as receptive right, to your reports or isn't that open to hearing about XG or what you want to talk about in terms of advanced metrics and modeling. Something like this could be a nice solution um, and at least a step function to get closer to you know, the analytics that you want to discuss with them. So that leads me to how to display data. And I think, you know, Complexity down to simplicity, especially for media, is the most important. Uh, so whether that's lists, you can see these are just advanced metrics comparing two players. You get the audience interested because it's two of their favorite players. And then you sneak in the advanced data too, because why not? So whether that's possession time per game, shot assists, so like passes that lead to shots, um, or you know, very traditional data sets. There's a wide variety of ways to compare and contrast um, whether that's team side, player side, um, or comparison to themselves. Uh, so this is where a goaltender is um, within the league, within other goaltender buckets. Um, same with these other elements. So um, for me, I just like to think of what my audience really wants to achieve. And if I can you know, tell it to a grade six, especially in media, that's probably the best gauge of, does this make sense? Uh, will someone understand it? And not only that, you know, can you play it in a bar without sound and still get it? And so this is um, an element where I actually did a second screen experience. So I'm not sure what happens in Europe, but we're really moving towards these like second screen data integrations. So I thought I'd show you a bit of what the outcome was. And you know, there's a lot of overlays of data that is in this um, one, both like player and puck tracking, some optical, and some just generated through uh, traditional tagging and metrics. But here's a little rundown of a actual broadcast I did that incorporated live data streams. Here's a quick recap of my Friday night. I did an NHL pilot alternative broadcast stream called NHL Edge Unlocked. It was powered by the NHL Edge positional data and available thanks to AWS Cloud Solutions. I was able to talk about a lot of data, including opportunity analysis, face-off probability, ice tilt, shot and save analytics, and much more. So watch these couple clips and get a little glimpse of the broadcast. Carolina might have known about is that Gensel is number one in the league for offensive zone shot recoveries, meaning he recovers a lot of the pops in the offensive zone on a shot and able to feed it to teammates. You know who shoots the most? I'm going to guess it's Carolina Hurricanes. The Carolina Hurricanes. <laughs> you got it right, Grant. 72.7 .7 per game. So Carolina's going to shoot it. Gensel's going to recover it. And that's a position we largely haven't had a lot of data for, goaltending. Where they're positioned, how they're reacting to the pucks, where they get beat. All of those great tidbits you can find with some of these data points. John Carlson has been playing a lot of minutes. He actually has two shots this season over 100 miles per hour. So not only playing a lot of minutes, but a really hard shot. One shot, that's 100.75 miles per hour. Ovechkin, too, very hard shot in that 90 to 100 mile per hour range. And he's in that shooter position again right here. Loading up for that one time. Another right? block. You look at this heat map, this Brent Burns shot map. Hey, he's shooting you from there a, right now. You have a good idea of where he's going to shoot from. Yeah. But you still can't stop him. Yeah. It yeah. comes from that high point, that long range shot. The Carolina Hurricanes are one of the best in edge for that long range shooting percentage and long range shots on net. It's because they have characters like Brent Burn. You can see that there's just a lot going on on that screen, but part of that is just testing it out. And so if anyone's in media or sports books, I think it's really great to like test things that are outside your comfort zone, whether that's putting 
you know, a lot of data in real time changing. You can see the shift times were on the bottom. So that's actually really nice in hockey. I know I joked at the start of this uh, talk that, you know, you have the players that are static. But in hockey, it's really confusing because the players not only can jump on the ice, but there's no like cadence as to when they come on and off. So typically they play with lines, but you can have a 20 second line change and have someone fly off the board. So to have you know, real time data that understands where the players are, it's actually really helpful for the fans to follow along, for fans in stadium to understand, um, and really for the broadcast. I'm actually taken aback usually when I come to Europe and go to soccer games, how little data there is in, in stadiums because in North America, we've almost gone the opposite way. I just went to the Blue Jays, which is an MLB team in Toronto. Not very good this year. I'm sorry I'm on live stream, but they had a ho horrible season. So I looked at a lot of the data because they were losing. It was terrible. But it was almost 10 times the data that was there five years ago. Um, I could see everything from spin rate to exit velocity to understand exactly what pitch that was to where the pitch was. So the acceleration in North America is not only dramatic in stadium, but I think that's pretty dramatic for hockey. Does anyone think that that would fly in, in soccer and football? Could you have a second screen that has all that data on it? Who thinks so? Got a North, couple more North Americans. Okay, some in the back. Who would actually watch it? Who wants that, that second screen experience? Would you tune in maybe just on your phone? Okay, yeah, and I think that's the thing is there's lots of demand for this type of you know, not only overlay on your phone, but possibly even in broadcast or a trigger that you could, you know, see all that data. So, you know, you're watching a team you don't know or you don't understand, well, you automatically know who's on the ice. You automatically know how fast they're skating and how fast the shot is. So conceptually thinking about how to translate that, whether it's to football or your own sport, um, and maybe even from a coaching side or an implementation of a real-time feedback, um, for any of your staff, I think it's incredibly compelling, especially if you can custom build what people like to look at. And that gets me, I have about two minutes left, so my end pitch, because I always get this, is I have a great idea, you know, how do I start a company? And I really think it's just the basics. I ripped this off Sam, Alt Sam Altman, who is OpenAI uh, founder. I mean, you can find a ton of, of stuff on how to do startups. Um, there's lots of big incubators in North America, Y Combinator, we have Mars Community Tech in Canada. Uh, I know that there's a lot in, in Europe as well. So really take advantage of what you have around you, what's in your local community. Think about your, your idea. It's fine to build something that won't scale. You just need clients. I'm sorry it's so small. I, I probably will share the slides anyways, so if you do want to see it, it's just Sam Altman's uh, four points on startups. But essentially, you know, your idea, your product, your team. And I think the biggest one that a lot of people overlook is execution. Execution is incredibly hard. I mean, I definitely had a lot of sleepless nights. I still do. I'm still answering emails and it's, I don't know, 4 a.m. in the morning at home. Um, but, you know, if you can just start and know that the path is not straight, but if you just keep going that there's an element where you can pivot into something that could conceptually be a business, I think it's really powerful. And a lot of people, especially in sports, they seem to be very siloed of, this is my job, this is what I love to do. And then either they lose their job or something happens and it disrupts their whole life. So really take advantage of the mindset that you have because you're a very, very smart, very impactful group. There's so much space and I would love to see not only more entrepreneurs, but more women entrepreneurs in this space. So that is my talk for today. Go entrepreneurship, and thank you for having me.